blessings flow. It's another day's journey, and we're glad about it. Uh, let me uh, welcome you to our Tuesday teaching. Uh, so happy to have you sharing with us um, on tonight. If you are watching from Facebook, I would ask and encourage you to like this post, love this post, react to this post, do anything but hit angry face. I never do understand that one. Uh, but <laughs> Or sad face, all right? But react to this post and please share it. Um, invite others who need to be reminded that it is our church night. Uh, so uh, you can help us in that regard by sharing this post. I want to thank those who are watching from our YouTube platform. I would encourage you to make sure you subscribe to our channel. Uh, you'll get notifications whenever we go live. Uh, plus, you can visit our channel and see where um, all of our services are organized and archived. And I want to welcome those who choose um, the other option we have, which is just um, listening by way of our telephone live streaming service. Uh, for those who are listening on tonight, uh, we welcome you. We're happy to have you with us as well. Um, I'm getting ready to open us up with a word of prayer, uh, but tonight we're going to be looking at Mark chapter number 10, verses 13 through 16, and I also want to read a couple of verses from Mark chapter number 9. But join me first for a word of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for this opportunity to come and to share, Lord, to listen to your word, to encounter and engage with your word. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but your word shall not pass away. We ask right now, God, for a fresh touch. Send a spirit of wisdom and of revelation knowledge. Bless us, God, our technology, that as your word goes forth, uh, it might find a lodging place uh, within us. We give you honor, glory, and praise. We thank you, God, for just seeing us through another day. Thank you, God, for your goodness and your faithfulness. Uh, what a privilege it is uh, to be able to not only teach, but also to be able to pray. God, so have thine own way on tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Amen. Again, welcome everyone. Uh, so tonight we are continuing in this series on Stop Being Messy. And uh, we've looked at some different instances uh, in Mark's gospel where the disciples, uh, thinking they're being helpful, uh, sort of get in the way. And Jesus has to redirect them. Jesus has to uh, kind of tap their hand. Uh, Jesus has to, uh, to, to call them out um, and, and because they are operating not according to his will, uh, but they've gone off and just doing their own thing. And as a consequence, they're being messy. Uh, but the text that warrants our consideration tonight, I want to talk about this instance of children where people are bringing children to Jesus for Jesus to lay his hands on them and to bless them. And the disciples, again, thinking they're doing what's right, uh, try to prevent the children, and uh, Jesus has to uh, redirect them. And as I've been sharing other weeks, look, uh, mess is ubiquitous. Uh, this world itself is messy, and as a consequence, um, it's not uncommon to find mess even among the people of God. But the joy, the good news, the gospel of the matter is that uh, mess does not drive Jesus away or drive God off, but yet we're called, we're called to make corrections, okay? So again, we're looking at Mark tonight, chapter 10, verses 13 through 16, but before I go there, I'm going to read chapter 9, verses 36 through 37, and my subject for tonight's TNT is stop being messy with our children. Stop being messy with our children. So in chapter number nine of Mark's gospel, uh, and allow me to say this to give it even more context, chapters eight through 10 are basically about discipleship and Jesus' teaching and instructions on discipleship. What, does, what is discipleship? To be a disciple is to be a learner, a pupil, Students, So they were followers of Jesus. Notice Jesus never called or asked anybody to come join a church uh, per se, but Jesus invited them to follow him and to learn of him. And that's what the disciples are doing, and that's what Jesus is teaching about, just what it means to be a disciple and to be a follower of him. Because Again, God's ways are not our ways, nor God's thoughts our thoughts, um, and God will just call us to 
behave and to engage in a way that runs counter or contrary to our cultural context. Uh, Such was the case in the Bible, and such is the case in the year of our Lord, 2021. All right? So we're understanding that this is all in the broader context of a conversation and teachings on discipleship. Jesus does something in chapter 9, verse number 36. We find these words. Then he took a child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. All right, so this is important. Jesus saying when you welcome children, in his name, you're not just welcoming the child, but you're welcoming Jesus. And if you welcome Jesus, you're not just welcoming Jesus, but you're welcoming God. All right? The disciples clearly don't get it. They, 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 they hear what Jesus says, and maybe they understand in theory, uh, but they don't quite get it in their practice or their praxis. As we see in chapter number 10, verses 13 through 16, Uh, Because even after Jesus has already said what he said, in chapter 10, we define the disciples being messy and, uh, and, and, and being messy when it comes to welcoming and accepting and handling children. All right. Verse 13 of chapter 10 says, people were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. Here come the disciples getting in the way. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said, let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. Quit being messy. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms. He laid his hands on them and he blessed them. All right. So I want to share a little bit of my personal story. And I, and I was raised in New Bern, North Carolina. New Bern is, it's important you notice, the original capital of North Carolina. Before Raleigh, it was New Bern. And New Bern is also the birthplace of Pepsi. And then New Bern, thirdly, is home of the world's largest Harris Teeter. All right. So I'm a proud native of New Bern, situated at the confluence of the Trent and the News River in eastern North Carolina. Uh, but my dad and my, and, and, and my paternal side of the family, my grandmother and all my aunts and uncles, they were raised outside of New Bern in a place called Pamlico County. And uh, there was our home church. I wasn't raised in the Baptist tradition, um, but I was raised in, uh, in, at the Holy Church of God in Christ Jesus in Alliance, North Carolina. Alliance is a little hamlet of a town. The population is probably somewhere around or less than a thousand people. So it just wasn't terribly a long, it wasn't terribly a large church, a church with a lot of resources. Um, But it was a church where I was first told about Jesus, and it was a church that all my family went to. And uh, so I have really, really, really fond memories Um, of this church, and particularly in my adult life, as I look back on it, I'm really, really, really grateful to God uh, for my upbringing and for the time I spent um, in this church. Uh, In fact, I posted the other day on Facebook because it popped up in my memories um, that I had preached there maybe, it was before the pandemic, so two or three years ago, I had preached there. Uh, The church I was raised in, my father is now the pastor, and my father uh, leads um, this congregation, um, and I was afforded the great opportunity, the privilege of going back to preach for his, I believe it was his third or fourth pastoral anniversary. And, uh, you know, and when, every time I go to that church, again, just memories just flood my soul. And I posted a picture of it. You can see it um, on my Facebook page. Again, it wasn't a terribly large church, so there was not a lot of uh, classroom space. Certainly there was, you know, no gym, uh, no room or rooms or areas to send the children off uh, to play. Uh, Did not do a whole lot of trips. 
you know, with the, in the church I was raised, um, some of the things that, you know, I've seen done and have been a part of in other churches. Uh, but if nothing else, the church I was raised in, if nothing else, I grew up knowing that children belonged in church. And the reason I grew up knew it, knowing that is not because of so much anything that was constantly taught or told to me, but it was because of how they treated me. All right. So again, I'm growing up in this church, um, and it's a uh, again we we have a, a quite of a lengthy service uh, in this church. Uh, good, 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 good lengthy service. Um, in part because we had testimony service, right? You know, which part of worship does anybody want to stand up and say something about the Lord? And uh, that could go on for some time, right? And then we still had other things because however you felt the Spirit touching you and moving you and working on you, uh, you know, we were going to. Get, make room for it. It's a, but, but be mindful, I'm a small child. And, uh, and after the first service, particularly the first Sunday, we have a second service where they would swap out and some people from the pews would go to the pulpit, some people from the pulpit would go to the pews, and we do it all over again, right? So two services. Believe it or not, I was like a really rambunctious child, okay? So it was just tough for me to sit still, be calm, be patient for, you know, three maybe four hours. So, you know, I would uh, lay down on the pew for a while, uh, but the pew was wooden and uh, wasn't any cushion on it. So at some point, you know, that would become uncomfortable. So I may go lay down um, at the altar on the kneeling bench. It was very cushiony down there. <laughs> I might lay on the kneeling bench uh, after church. And it's my family church. We all knew everybody. You know, we were going to stay in fellowship and talk for a while before going to my grandma's house to eat. And uh, so, you know, after church, I might be the one uh, you know, snooping around the pulpit. Uh, there's no telling what I would be doing. Or I might be the one who, you know, <laughs> you know, randomly saying something in the middle of the service. And, uh, you know, while it is my mother, who's probably watching tonight, sometimes she would squinch and kind of tap me on my leg and tell me to kind of take a chill pill. Uh, the elders of the church, I would always say, it's okay. It's okay. Just let him be. And I remember so vividly times, even where I may be running across the pulpit, <laughs> you know, at the church, you know, whereas, you know, whereas that's just the worst thing in the world in some churches, and it's, and it's probably not best practice, uh, but, you know, I may just be running around the church, and, you know, my mom or my parents might say, boy, you better get out that pulpit. You know, well, well, somebody else might say, hey, who knows? He may end up preaching one day. <laughs> and uh, I look back on that time now with just such fond memories because, if nothing else, um, I always grew up knowing that children belong in church and have a role in church. So even as I started playing drums, you know, at home, a small boy, I went from having, you know, a little paper drum set to a little kid's drum set to actual real drum set. And at every turn, at every stage, if I wanted to play drums in church, they would let me play drums in church. And, uh, you know, and my dad, even he was looking at me, as like, you know, you're playing too slow or you're playing too fast or you're playing too loud. Uh, the church family at large would just always be so accepting and loving of quirky old me. And not me only, but all the children. There was, just, there was just the attitude there towards children was just something like I had never experienced in my life. And as I think about it now, you know, in my adult life, I don't remember a whole lot of, uh, of sermons. Um, I certainly remember a whole lot of things that people used to say, particularly in testimony service, because I would, Sunday evening, I would be mimicking them. <laughs> but in terms of like what was preached and and these kind of things, you know, I can't say um, I remember a whole lot. And, uh, you know, church was long, so we wouldn't necessarily go all the time for, 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 for Sunday school, um, you know, by the time we got from New Bern. So, you know, it just wasn't a whole lot there in the way of, you know, learning everything about the Bible. But I learned what the Lord needed me to learn in that season, which was you belong in the church. And as I think about it in my adult life, I kind of wonder you know, of all the seeds that were sown, of how they treated me, I just wonder how things may have turned out differently had I not been welcomed, had I not been embraced, had there been folk like the disciples in our text um, who wanted to prevent children, instead of encouraging them, who wanted to prevent children from getting to Jesus. And so the question uh, that really, really warrants consideration that I want us to turn over some in our mind and have some conversation about, and that is, what is the role of children in our churches? What is the role of children in our churches? 
And along with that, I would ask and just have us to give some consideration to, you know, when a child does come up and lean on the communion table, when a child does come up and crawl into the pulpit, when a child does maybe find their way to the choir stand and take a drumstick and just, and hits a cymbal, why <laughs> does that irk people so? And what is it maybe that, how is it that maybe instead of chastising, we could just maybe redirect children some um, as to not hinder them, as to not, as to not squelch an early fire that could be burning. The reason I think about this and the reason um, I raise this is because just my own experience is, you know, I, I was that child running all over the church. Um, I was that child into everything. I was in that child. Sometimes mama had to take me. I was that child. Sometimes mama had to take me outside because, again, there weren't a bunch of rooms and these kind of things. You just, you just had to go outside <laughs> for a while and, and have, a, have, a, uh, have a stern conversation. You know, sometimes sometime the, the, uh, the board of correction was applied to my seat of knowledge outside, right? Um, <laughs> I don't want to go too much into this, but <laughs> I do know, you know, I ended up in my adult life where I've worked in and around the church. I've been pastor now for 11, um, almost 12 years, and uh, I'm grateful for the journey. And I think about, you know, man, how even early before I saw it, uh, understood it. Uh, I think the Lord was already calling me. Um, but what that looked like to others could have been offensive. What that looked like to others, you know, could have saw me as a nuisance. When I believe um, that that was the earliest stages of God actually stirring up something, stirring up something in me. So what then is the role? What is the place for children in the church. As I said earlier, we're in Mark's gospel. Mark chapters 8 through 9 uh, deal with this theme, this idea of discipleship. And what we quickly discover and learn is that discipleship is not defined by status, amen somebody, but it's defined by relationship, particularly, in particular, one service to, to others and those who are less fortunate. Jesus is going to say this much twice in these chapters that, you know, one who wants to be great has to be a servant of all, right? Has to be a servant of all. Because it's interesting, in chapter 9, what leads Jesus to making, what leads Jesus to even um, taking this child and wrapping this child in his arms and saying, whoever welcomes one such child welcomes me, what leads this teaching is the disciples kind of arguing among themselves about greatness and who is the greatest among them, right? And particularly, you know, because Jesus has already been kind of alluding and teaching uh, that he's going to, you know, he's not going to be with them, but for so long, they're already kind of jockeying for positions. Who's going to be next? Who is among the group? Who, for real, for real, is the HNIC? Who? Right? But, but, but Jesus... <laughs> gives them a, a different paradigm that totally shatters their expectations as it relates to greatness. And it's unfortunate, but this is still something we are wrestling with, we're having to contend with in the church because there are so many people, and, and, and this is true, you know, especially among clergy and especially among gospel music artists, you know, we want to be famous in church. We want to be Jesus famous, <laughs> right? You know, uh, I know, I know there's been a lot of rumbling uh, this year as rapper Kanye West, uh, who is, you know, a billionaire, um, but who is, you know, by all accounts, somewhat on the mentally unbalanced side, uh, but he's a music genius and he has, uh, you know, he, he, put out a gospel, uh, he put out a gospel album a couple of years ago, more recently. His most recent album um, is charting on gospel charts. It's something like, you know, he's like, of, if there are, of the, of the top 20 gospel songs, you know, probably, uh, <laughs> you know, his following is so large, you know, he probably is holding more than half of those slots. I mean, it's just really crazy and it's really um, unprecedented. And there are a lot of, you know, gospel artists who are very upset about this. A lot of people in general who are just very, very, very upset about this, 
right? You know, because he is taken and he is still in that shine, right? But, you know, where, where I press back and where I would like to have some conversation with, you know, sometimes artists or people who consider themselves artists is, you know, why is it so important to you that you be Jesus famous, <laughs> right? Because it just does not square with what Jesus talked about when it comes to discipleship. And even think about this pandemic of preachers having to preach now to empty rooms, particularly those who are used to, you know, being before thousands, right? And wouldn't even come to a church if, you, if, it's, if, it, if it wasn't going to have a certain size building, certain size congregation. You know, we've gone from that, the preachers now preaching, having to preach. And we move past this now, but particularly in 2020, you know, the preachers, you know, in a bathrobe, you know, preaching to their cell phone in the living room. God has a way of humbling us. And now I know a lot of preachers, myself included, are thinking differently um, about crowds and these kind of things. But when it comes to us, you know, uh, churches, you know, uh, trying to make our name great, trying to, you know, be this, that, and the third, why is it so important to us that we be famous? Why is it so important to us that we be so large? When, when we think about what Jesus talked about and what Jesus taught uh, when it comes to discipleship, that greatness is not about status, right? It, it's, it, you know, you, what makes you great is not that, you know, you're known across the world, but what makes you great is your willingness to serve and to, take on, and to embrace the last, the least, and the loss. What makes you great is your humility and your willingness to do little things, right? Uh, even when it comes to Abraham, I think about Abraham's call. You know, God said, I'm going to make Abraham your name great. When God called him in Genesis chapter 12 and somebody in chapter 15 too, God said, I'm going to make your name great. He never told Abraham to make his own name great, to go build his own uh, empire, right? God says, I'm going to make your name great. So if greatness is to be had in the life of individuals and in the life of the church, I contend that for one, it has to come from God. And then secondly, we can never lose sight of what true gratefulness of what true greatness is, particularly in the context of discipleship. And it's not about status. It's about relationship. Somebody say relationship. It's about relationship, particularly to those who um, are less fortunate. All right, so here's something else I want you to notice. As we come to our text, chapter 10, verses 13 through 16, this comes on the heels of Jesus teaching about marriage. Now, I'm not going to get into into this tonight, but I would need you to understand, men and women of God, that when it comes to the Bible, and this is often said, it's not original to me, but a text with no context is a pretext. And one of the things I think we tend to do, and I think the teach, Jesus' teaching on divorce is very emblematic of this, of us just doing the Bible wrongly, is when we take what Jesus said and we don't give any consideration to the context or the culture, and then we bring it to our time now and we just impose it on folk because that's what the Bible says. But we never wrestle with what that means and what Jesus may have been after. Okay, so again, I'm not here to go all into that tonight, um, but we can certainly have further conversation and Bible study on this. And chapter, Jesus' teachings on divorce, about not divorcing, that, that is what he's talking about right before we go into this thing on children. And since I brought it up, let, let me just read it, just a little bit of it real quick. It says, he left that place in chapter 10, went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, and crowds gathered around him, as was his custom And again, he taught them. Some Pharisees came to him and asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed for a right of certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of hearts, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So there's no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no person put asunder. And then he says there too that, you know, that, well, let me read it. (laughs) Get this thing right. I want y'all to think I'm making nothing up. Then in the house, uh, the disciples asked him again about this matter. 
He said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And there are preachers who will not marry folk or will not, you know, officiate a service today um, because couples have been divorced for reasons maybe other than adultery. And it all goes back to this teaching, these words of Jesus that we find in the gospel. All right. But, you know, sometimes, again, if you give some consideration to the cultural context, first of all, you have to consider and notice the words there. It says that a man shall not divorce a woman in a patriarchal society, particularly as the world was then, a woman could not divorce a man. It was something that a man could do. And then guess what? When a woman was divorced, um, she had no recourse. She would have been among the powerless, right? She had no recourse. I mean, you know, women were, and, and, and we still got a ways to go with this, but women were in, in no wise as empowered then in the ancient world as they are now. <laughs> you know, where, you know, in, the, in this United States of America, we have a woman who is the vice president of the United States. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, that's significant. That, that's, 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 that's powerful, Okay. And let me bring this up, too. So, you know, one text that we just, again, because, you know, look, believe everything the Bible says, but don't believe everything people tell you the Bible says. Lord, I just said something right there. Believe everything the Bible says, but you can't believe everything people tell you the Bible says. You know, I think about this story about the woman. Uh, We bring this up by the well. Jesus goes there, and, you know, he says to her, go call your husband. And she says, I don't have one. He's like, that's right. You know, you got five, and the one you're with, you're not married to. And, you know, people have used that text, used Jesus' words to just bash this woman and to treat this woman with such disdain and these kind of things. When, in fact, hear this, she could not have divorced a man. She had been divorced by a man five times. So, so I would contend that that story is as much about someone being rejected as anything else. You know, right? But, but, but we put the onus and the blame so much on the woman. It's kind of like, and I think about when they brought the woman who had been caught in adultery, right, to Jesus. Look at, look, at, look at the context. Look at the society. Where was the man? You can't catch a woman in adultery in the act by herself, right? And they wanted Jesus to condemn her. They wanted Jesus to be strict to the letter of the law. But Jesus says, let the one who was out sin cast the first stone. So coming back to understanding this, coming back to this text and Jesus' teaching on divorce, because do you realize then how cruel it would have been for a man to divorce a woman? So what does that look like now? Just because a man wake up and a woman didn't do everything he wanted done, he just divorces her. And her her life is ruined, and she has no recourse. And Jesus saying in this text, that is not okay. That is not okay to just throw a woman away. So again, by Jesus coming with this teaching, you know, in terms of like quick, you know, don't go get divorced over willy-nilly stuff. I'm not convinced that that then means that today, you know, people should stay in abusive relationships, stay in toxic relationships, you know, or, or anything like that. I'm, I just do not believe that. I believe, he, I believe that he, he came to we might have life and have it more abundantly, right? I believe that to, you know, that to continue to go through certain things is just in particularly abusive relationships, is not consistent with the witness of the New Testament and with everything else that Jesus says, right? So again, I'm raising this point because this teaching on divorce, now we got this teaching on children. What is the link? What is the thing? Jesus is talking about how we handle and treat people who for one reason or another are vulnerable, Right? Because a woman in the ancient world, particularly in the context of marriage, very vulnerable. Because if the man divorced her, she would be considered, right? You know, use good. She would not have the opportunity or the access that men would have had. And Jesus does not want men just going around divorcing women willy nilly. That creates a very cruel, warped, twisted society. Yes, Moses did permit divorce, but Jesus wants to know, like, in the beginning, it was not so. He only did that because your hearts were so hard. Because your hearts were so hard. That's why Moses did that. So divorce is not ideal. Divorce is is not ideal. It's not, I contend, the perfect will of God. (laughs) But at the same time, some of these marriages to begin with were not the perfect will of God either. 
All right, is, is, are, are you telling me I'm at 30 minutes or are you giving me a, a wave in your hand saying amen? <laughs> okay, all right, thank you in the back. Okay, <laughs> a little bit of both. All right. All right, so, so again, I want us to get that, that context there. So we're going from teaching on divorce, now we're talking about children. So Jesus, Jesus' welcoming of children, and we see this in verse number 16, is an example of the positive attitude he had towards those who did not have an important social status. Women didn't have an important social status, particularly wife. Children did not have an important status social status. All right. So uh, guess what? Tax collectors did not have an important social status, but we read in Mark, Jesus welcoming, eating, receiving, accepting them all. Okay. So it is, I want to know, I want to note this. It is the objective social status of small children that is the background of Jesus' statement in verse number 15, that one must receive the kingdom of God like a child. And I'm raising this point because I think, you know, we talk a lot about children now and it seems like a lot of our life and our, and our, our world is, um, is, is, is geared towards children, right? You know, we, we set our schedules, we do so many things around, you know, how it's going to impact, how it's going to affect children. But even still, even still, you know, there are some gruesome, horrifying stories of children being taken out of homes every single day. Social services and, 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 and child protective services are just as needed and necessary today as it's ever been. So isn't that interesting? While there's all this talk and marketing of children being so wonderful at the same time, so many children are being treated so poorly, so badly. Even right here in North Carolina, we rank high among other uh, states when it comes to child poverty. Okay, but I want you to understand. So, so, so I'm saying all this to say, don't look at this text and just because again, a text with no context is a pretext. Don't look at this text. Don't take Jesus' words without giving consideration to the cultural context. And you know, you have some kind of romanticized vision of children in terms of being like children. That means just being cute and dad, dad, goo goo, and all that kind of stuff. That's not here what the Bible is implying. It is the objective social status of small children. That's the background for Jesus' statement in verse 15, that one must receive the kingdom of God just like a child. This statement does not refer to any supposed innocence, right? Because, you know, we, we say children are so innocent, right? You know, not for long. Y'all got kids? <laughs> innocent my foot, all right? Or humility, right? or any other imagined qualities of children. So what I'm suggesting is don't take, you know, the, the Hollywood imagery of, of a child and think that's what Jesus is saying or suggesting in this text. But instead, Jesus is referring to the cultural situation where children, listen, were totally dependent upon the will of others and had no legal uh, or social weight to make claims for particular treatment, right? So, you know, in, in our world, in our society, at least we do have a such thing <laughs> as, you know, child advocacy, right? And uh, or if children are being, you know, neglected or abused, at least there, there's some recourse there in terms of, you know, if, if a report is made or if something's found out through school, there's some kind of recourse. But again, in the ancient world, children didn't have enough status to make any such claim or demand for a particular treatment. So whatever they got was just what they got. So consider, <laughs> so here's where something I find helpful. If we want to think about what does this mean, what might Jesus be saying when he says we have to receive the children, we have to receive the kingdom like children. Here's something I think about. Think about the designation of children on an IRS income tax form. What they called? Dependents. I think that's important. I think that's instructive. I think that is indicative of what this text really might be tailored to teach us. This text, I want to contend, is a call to become like children. That is a radical call to dependence. Listen, the person who imagines that he or she is somehow worthy of God's favor and 
that participation in the kingdom of God depends on social or religious rank will never really enter the kingdom of God that Jesus announces. I contend, I want to submit to us, that when Jesus talks about we need to become like children, (laughs) what he's saying, you know, I think that is a call for dependence on God. That is a call for radical dependence on God. And I think about, you know, I have children, one eight, one um, almost two. And they depend on parents, right? When it comes to shelter, when it comes to clothing, when it comes to feeding them, they depend. And, 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 and when they get it, they aren't always the most grateful. All right, I'll feed my little two-year-old. He, you know, he, he doesn't, you know, say to me, you know, thank you, Dad. That was just awfully kind of you. <laughs> he, doesn't have, he doesn't have a concept of that just yet. But what he does do is depend on me. What my daughter does do is depend on me. This is the kind, and when you think about dependence, that's synonymous, right, with words like trust. They have, listen, a confidence in me. My daughter doesn't wake up thinking, you know, oh, Lord, how are we going to, how am I going to get three meals today? How am I going to eat lunch and dinner? No, no, she's confident that that's going to happen. If anything, <laughs> if anything, she wants, you know, crab legs, not chicken. <laughs> right? But, but there's no question. There's no question there in terms of whether or not she's going to eat and where it's going to come from. She depends on myself and my wife as parents. So children, think about it. Children are those who don't worry so much. And we got to receive the kingdom like children. Here's where I'm going. So that, that means dependence, number one. Children are those who don't worry so much about tomorrow. Or, or, or children are those who trust their lives and their well-being to a power beyond themselves. Such trusting does not mean uh, children are unquestioning. Anybody got any children? My favorite question. Favorite question. What? Why? <laughs> Why? That's the favorite question of children, right? So, 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 you know, receiving the kingdom doesn't mean that you'll always be without questions. But receiving the kingdom as a child means that doubts, questions, and even protests can be voiced to God without a fear that doing so will threaten the continual gift of love. I don't care what kind of spat... <laughs> I may have with my children this evening. They don't wake up thinking tomorrow. They don't wake up tomorrow worried about, okay, well, you know, dad ain't going to feed me now. Or, you know, I'm getting ready to get put out the house. Or anything such that they don't worry in that regard. And I think there's something for us to be gained. I think about the words of Psalm 103, verses 13 and 14, where it says, And the Father has compassion for children. So the Lord has compassion on those who fear him, for he knows how we're made, and he remembers that we are dust. Just as a father has compassion on children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. And what I'm trying to say to us, friends, is that if we're going to receive the kingdom like children, that means dependence on God, dependence on God, but it also means not worrying so much, right? Because we trust our well-being into a power that is beyond ourself. Receiving the kingdom of God like a child means going to God with your questions, with your doubts, and even your protests. Yes, God can handle your emotions. Yes, that can be voiced to God without fear that God's going to run off and leave me, without fear that God's going to get in his feelings and God is going to get petty with me. We can go to God without fear that God is going to, for some reason, just throw us away. Why? Because as a father has compassion on his child, so does God have compassion on those who fear him. And we're talking about fear in this context. This is, this is reverence. This is, this is about awe, right? This is about the recognition of who God is in our lives. And who is God? God is the maker of heaven and earth. The earth is the Lord, the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. We are God's creation. And for those of us who confess Christ, we are God's children. 
And so as a consequence, we should not, and we don't have to worry <laughs> as much or be, or, or, or we, should, we don't have to worry so much like the world worries or like those who have no relationship, who have no dependence on God. Amen, somebody? So we are called, hear this, to not only keep from hindering children, because Jesus is going to say, and I talked about this in chapter 9, talked about this the other week, Jesus is going to say, like, you know, woe to the person who causes these little ones to stumble. It'll be better for you. You better check your hands, check your, check your feet, check your eyes. If your eye causes you to make people stumble, particularly little ones, marginalized, folk like the children, plug one of your eyes out. Or if your hands, cut that hand off. Or if your foot, cut that foot off. It's better to enter life maimed or with one eye than to be destroyed in hell. All right? So we're called, listen, not only to keep from hindering children, but also to engage in action. We're called to advocate for programs and policies that address children's issues. Where do children belong? <laughs> I, I started by saying I grew up uh, knowing that there was a place for children in church. Where do children belong? Let me tell you where they do not belong. Children do not belong with abusive parents or guardians. I think about this, and this is passion. This is important to me. Because there was a girl who I buried earlier this year who I was very near and dear to, had a close relationship with her. She was taken away from her parents, and, you know, and she, she, she lived, ended up living a really, really hard life, but she was taken away from her parents at something like the age of three because her parents were permitting and allowing her to be sexually abused. And I wish that that was an anomaly. I wish that that was something that never happens in the world today, that never happens in, our, in the city of Charlotte, that never happens here. No, it does. It does. Here, right here in Charlotte, just, um, you know, and let, let me go here. When, when, when it comes to where children don't belong. Children do not belong in underfunded schools or inadequate daycare centers. Children do not belong in prisons, having been lured into crime while living in poverty or despair. Right, a couple of weeks ago, we had a 15-year-old uh, to be, here in Charlotte, to be gunned down and was killed by a 13-year-old. That's a child. Children don't belong. Children don't belong. And, and this person will likely, I don't, I don't know how that's going to get uh, litigated. I don't know how that's going to get handled. I'm not here to make any kind of argument for what justice might look like in that situation. But here's what I will put forward. Children don't belong in prisons, particularly when they were lured into that kind of lifestyle because they were living in poverty and living in despair. Children don't belong in the streets as prostitutes. Children don't belong in play as victims of commercial sexual exploitation. And I think about this because, you know, right here, um, again, I live in Charlotte. Charlotte's the largest city in North Carolina. As a consequence, we have a higher number than other cities around the state when it comes to child trafficking. You know, one time Concord Mills in particular was thought to be a hub for that kind of stuff, particularly be, and for a number of reasons because of, of, because of where it is and because of how Concord Mills is built. You know, and I, I live not too far from there. I clutch my children. <laughs> I'm there all the time, but I, I, I keep an eye on them when I'm around Concord Mills, right? Um, I think about, you know, in Charlotte, we have a lot of things that come to town, you know, big events that draw a lot of people, and I'm not calling out anybody or anything, but you know what else goes up when you have all these large events in your city? Uh, the numbers when it comes to child prostitution. And there are programs, there are things that are put in place. Um, I, I didn't come prepared to talk about this tonight, but I know one initiative, I think through the Sisters of Mercy, that involves them putting soap in hotels uh, because there are children who are being victimized and there are children who are caught up in sexual exploitation and a little bit and the only freedom they'll have will be sometime in the bathroom uh, in these hotels, but on the soap, there's a number for them to call and to reach out if they need that kind of help, if they need advocacy, if they need intervention, all right? So children don't belong in these situations. Children do not belong in these situations. They don't belong with abusive parents or guardians. They don't belong on sick beds without access to health care. Come on, somebody. They don't belong in underfunded schools 
inadequate daycare centers. They don't belong there. They don't belong in, un, they don't belong in prisons. They don't belong there having been lured into crime while living in poverty and despair. They do not belong on our streets as prostitutes, as victims of commercial sexual exploitation. So why am I bringing this up? What, what, <laughs> how do we stop being messy as adults? There's a call here for us as Christians. There's a call here for us as believers. There's a call here for us. We, we got to enter the kingdom like children ourselves. So we have to advocate for programs and policies that address children's issues. We are called to engage and to be in action when it comes to these matters. Amen? Amen and amen. So stop being messy. Stop being messy, particularly when it comes to our children. Children were coming to Jesus, and the disciples kind of get in the way. And I think the disciples were coming from a good place. I really do. Because I think the disciples were coming from this place of Jesus is very busy. Everybody, there's always a great demand on him for his time, his attention. And they probably thought they were doing, they probably thought they were being helpful. Oh, 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 don't bother Jesus. But the problem is they spoke sternly. And then Jesus, and, that, and that's what upset Jesus. And Jesus said, ah, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. He has to redirect them. He has to redirect them because he wants them in their service. Because, again, this is a conversation about discipleship. And disciples have to be servants of all, right? Even those who are on the margins of society. All right, so in Mark's gospel, you're talking about tax collectors. In the ancient world, you're talking about women. You're certainly talking about women who had no, you're talking about children who had no social status, no rank. But even still, here comes Jesus saying to them in no uncertain terms, you know, that your, serve, that, that, that your ministry involves service to people like this. So here's a question to ponder as we leave. How can we be of even more service to others? How can we engage more? How can we be of even more service to others? Because, again, when I think about children in particular, there's a lot of programs, a lot of opportunities out there for children. But at the same time, you still got a lot of children who are just in really jacked up situations. If you don't believe me, talk to anybody from any department of social services in any of North Carolina's 100 counties. And the stories that are coming out, you know, and even, you know, what we read in the paper will make the hair stand up on the back of your neck. So we still got work to do in this regard. Amen. Amen. And amen. I've kept you too long. But thank you so much for sharing with us tonight. Hey, look, I'm excited. I really want you to come through tomorrow night for revival. We're starting at seven promptly. Um, it's going to be in person, but it's also going to be virtual. I would encourage people to come. But I would also say if you, if you don't feel comfortable, uh, maybe if you're going to get here late, because we are going to have a limit on our numbers. Um, so, you know, maybe it is best for some, or we certainly need some people to watch from home. Um, but it's going to be very, very powerful and impactful. We have coming to preach uh, the Reverend Dr. J. Vincent Terry. He's the pastor of the Mount Peace Missionary Baptist Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. We have coming to minister up to us through song. An incredibly gifted young man um, who has an amazing testimony of some things he's been through. This time last year, he was fighting for his life with COVID, uh, but the Lord brought him back. He's been through some other things, and he is an incredible, gifted psalmist. He's, he, he's coming to us off from Raleigh. Um, his name is Elder Owen Forbes, and he's going to bless us in an incredible way. So I want you see, I want you situated, whether you're watching online or you're going to be with us, I want you situated promptly at 7 p.m. We're going to have a good time in the Lord. I'm believing and trusting God to revive us again. One night of revival, just one night, and it's going to be tomorrow at 7 p.m., and uh, I'm excited about that. Amen. Amen. Also, too, I want you to keep in family, the, keep, in, keep in your prayers, the Woods and Bugs family. We lost a dear member, Sister Patricia Bugs. Uh, we lost her um, on this past Friday. Her homegoing service is going to be this Saturday here at Reader at uh, 2 p.m., and that's going to be available on our virtual platforms for you to watch. Um, and then also there's going to be a viewing for her on Friday at the funeral home. And uh, you can reach out to us if you need more information about that. I would encourage you before you go tonight to support us through your giving. Please, uh, you can't beat God giving uh, no matter how hard you try. So please support us uh, with your, with, uh, financially with your giving. Your gift makes it possible for us to continue to extend our witness and continue to do that which the Lord has put on our hearts um, and put us in this community to do. Amen. Join me for a word of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for tonight, this opportunity to listen and reflect on your word. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but your word shall not pass away. I'm asking God that you might uh, move and touch and bless us. Allow us, God, to hear tonight what the Spirit is saying to the church. Show us, God, 
uh, the ways that we can be more impactful when it comes to encouraging children. Show us, God, correct us, God, when it comes to the ways that we have not been helpful, that we have been a hindrances uh, to children. That's not what we want to do, but we want to encourage uh, children. We want to let our children know that they belong uh, that they are children of the kingdom, that they belong uh, to the church, that they belong to the family of God. Show us the way. Guide us. Give us wisdom. Give us strength. Help us, God, to be what you would have us to be, our uh, God, in these last and evil days. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. May God bless you and may heaven smile upon you. Hit my music, please. <laughs>